Good evening, everyone. Thanks for being here and spending the night with us. My name is Paco de la Cruz. I work for Deloitte in the platform engineering practice. Uh, and tonight I'm going to be talking about serverless. How many of you have worked with any of the serverless frameworks? It's your functions or AWS Lambda, Google Cloud Functions? Yeah, a few of you. Cool. So this is going to be a bit of introduction and also um, what's good, what's bad, and what's ugly about serverless. Cool. So, so you can follow me on Twitter. I have a, a blog as well where I tweet. Uh, I post some some of the, the, the cool things I'm, I'm working on. The demos that I'm showing tonight are on my GitHub, and um, you can also follow me on LinkedIn. And the slides will be available on, on my slide share as well, probably tonight or tomorrow at the latest. Cool. So the agenda for tonight. First, I'm going to talk about what serverless. Um, who are the main players of the serverless space, then some use cases when to use serverless, and then we're going to go deeper into what's good, what's bad, and what's ugly about the, all this. And then hopefully we have enough time for two demos and some key takeaways at the end. Feel free to interrupt me at any time. So what's serverless? Two months ago, I had the privilege to go to one of the cloud centers here in Australia. They invited me to one of the data centers, one of the main cloud providers, and uh, they allowed me to take a picture of where the serverless are hosted. And this is, this is the, the picture I took. As you can see, there are no servers in the racks. So they are very smart. They, they managed to create all these platforms without servers in the, in the racks. Well, that's not true. Sorry to disappoint you, but um, <laughs> there are servers behind serverless. Um, so what's serverless? Um, so if we consider the different options that we have for cloud computing on the different cloud providers, um, so some options give us more control, some options give us more productivity. So the most basic ones is virtual machines or infrastructure as a service. Um, so these are the first wave of offerings that we had in the, on the cloud, right? So just uh, creating VMs but we are still managing the, the operating systems. We are still uh, patching the, the VMs and all that. Then uh, they started offering platform as a service where we don't need to worry about VMs or operating systems. We only care about the platform and the solution that we deploy on top of this. And later on, they released the third wave of evolution, which is serverless. There are other options as well. Uh, so at the left of platform as a service, we also have containers as a service. And there is also other offering called function as a service on top of um, container orchestrators or Kubernetes. And there is also low code platforms. So across all these uh, options in this spectrum, we will be focusing only on serverless function as a service this night. That means that we won't cover uh, what they call serverless containers or container containers as a service. So we won't be talking anything, anything about AWS Fargate or Azure Container Instances or Google Cloud Run, and we won't be talking about functions of service on container orchestrators like OpenFast or Knative or Kada. So we'll be focusing mostly on serverless function, functions of service. Um, so what serverless functions of service and what are the main benefits? So the first two characteristics are that uh, the servers, there are servers, uh, but they are fully abstracted. So you don't need to worry about those servers. You just uh, worry about your, your code. You deploy it on those instances, and that's it. You don't need to worry about VMs or scaling those VMs or patching those VMs. There is also um, so all the scaling, high, high availability, and load balancing is also provided for you with, without you need to worrying of, of that. So let's say you deploy a, a function on, on, on your platform. And then you can scale out to 50 instances, and the, the, the load can be split ac across those instances. You need to worry about load balancing them. Um, again, high availability. So if one of these instances goes down, they will spin up a new instance without you even noticing. So all of this is fully managed for you. And you might be wondering, well, some other pass offerings already give me that. So what's the difference between serverless and, and the other pass offerings? So serverless is one of the pass flavors, but has some additional features. So what's different to, to the other pass offerings? So the first one is the scaling is based on events. So let's say you have none of the pass offerings. You usually scale based on CPU or memory. Here you scale based on events. Uh, and the scaling is very, very fast. 
So instead of the cloud provider to waiting until you reach 50% of, or 80% of CPU utilization, they, they, they react based on the events that they are in the queue or the, all the HTTP requests that are coming through. Uh, also, there are some programming models, meaning that um, we will see this in the demo. So you don't need to worry about the plumbing to connect to the HTTP listener, or you need to worry about the plumbing to connect to the, to the queue or to the storage. All of that is abstracted from you. So you just worry about the code that you need to write for your business uh, requirement. And you only pay for what you use, meaning that if the function is idle, you're not paying for that. Um, so you only pay when the function is being executed. Um, in a nutshell, all the serverless functions or service offerings have this, this, um, this structure. So there is a trigger. And this trigger can be a message in a queue, can be a HTTP request, can be um, can be a file in a storage container, or can be a webhook, right? So depending on the cloud provider, you would have different triggers. Then that event will trigger your code, right? Code in different languages, and then your code would output some some result in again another message in on, onto a queue or a file into a storage account or something like that. So the, in, the triggers and the outputs vary, vary based on the cloud provider, and then you have code in the middle. So who are the main players in serverless functions as a service? So depending on your cloud, you have different options. If you're on AWS, you have Lambda, and Lambda were the first main mainstream provider of serverless FAS. Then after Lambda, Azure came, came along with functions, and then later Google joined the party with Google Cloud Functions. They are very similar in terms of what they what they provide, but they have different features. So starting from language support, so Node, JS, and Python are supported in the three of them, in three cloud providers. But for example, if you want to write Go, you cannot do it on Functions and on Azure Functions. Or if you want to uh, use .dot .NET Core or PowerShell Core, you cannot do it on Google Cloud. So depending on the language you, you want to use, you, you need to use different providers. Um, the triggers are, again is not is not are not the same for every of the cloud providers. So all of them support HTTP or webhooks. But for example, on, on AWS, you would have Alexa events triggering your functions. On on function on Azure functions, you would have Event Grid or Cosmo TV, who are uh, particular to Azure. And then on Google Cloud, you have Google Cloud pops up or Stack Driver logging, etc. Right. So the the triggers would vary from provider to provider. Okay, so when shall we use uh, serverless? So the, the most obvious one is to, to write APIs, and these APIs can be for backends for single page applications, can be backends for mobile apps or for IoT solutions as well. <clears throat> Another use case is for integration scenarios where we need to implement pops of services, we need to send messages from one system to the other. We can also use it for event stream processing. So let's say we have some events um, being processed through a through a stream. We can we can start ingesting those events. We can also implement some data data processing using uh, parallel processing with MapReduce. We can also implement um, automation jobs. So we can run similar to cron, cron jobs, run a job every every day at 5 a.m. or run a run a job every every week on Sundays at 7 7 a.m. for example. We can also implement backends for chatbots, right? So there are different use cases where we can implement serverless. <clears throat> Any questions so far regarding serverless before we go deep into what's good, what's bad, and what's ugly about serverless? Is it very clear or very confusing? <laughs> pattern? Pop stop services meaning um, you have it's a pattern where you have one system provides a, a message. Say, let's say you have an HR system, and uh, this HR system is the system of record for your employee data, right? So every time you create a new employee in that system, you drop a message saying uh, there is a new employee in, in a queue, and then there might be multiple subscribers saying, I want, to, I want to subscribe to those employees, and then you can create those employee records in different systems. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, just a question. Yep. Regarding the triggers, do we have specified set of triggers on even or can you provide a custom triggers? 
Um, there, there, so there are APIs or frameworks to, to develop extensions for yourself. Um, and then in many times you can also translate your custom events to HTTP. So as long as you can translate your custom event to HTTP, you can trigger any of these. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All good? Okay. Um, so what's good about serverless? So the, the best thing about serverless really is speed to market. So you can, you can see, hopefully you can see in the demo. So you can build solutions very quick, very fast, and then deploy, deploy to production. Uh, or even can be an M, uh, MVP, right? So a minimum viable product and demo something and provide some value to, you, to your business very quickly. You can, you can deliver value to the market very, very quickly. You focus on business value, you, you forget about load balancing, high availability, um, scaling and all that, even connecting to the, the triggers and or, or the, the triggers or connecting to the to the outputs, it's all abstracted from you. So you focus on the, on the core of the business you want to solve or the requirements you want to solve. If you have sporadic loads, um, the cost is very optimal because you don't pay when the functions are idle. The scaling is event-based. So again, this is ideal for bursty loads. So if you don't know when you're gonna receive requests or events, uh, just deploy your function and then the function will take care of all the scaling. Um, and it's very, so the scaling is usually very aggressive. So instead of, as I mentioned before, instead of waiting for the CPU to spike above 80%, it will check the metrics of the queue or the HTTP request and then it will scale, scale out very quickly. There are very mature tools and, and, and um, to, to develop and monitor these solutions. And also the runtime is usually, so all of the cloud providers allow you to run the, 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 this, this, oh, these options locally or on-prem. They, they wouldn't be serverless anymore, but it allows you to develop or test your functions locally as well. And then you have event triggers. So as I mentioned, it's not HTTP, you, you have all these event triggers. So this is really good about serverless. But it's not only about the good. So there are some things that are not so good. So the first one is vendor lock-in. So once you decide to uh, develop an AWS Lambda, then you're already tied to that <coughs> provider. Um, so you could reuse part of the code, but the programming language, or the programming model, or the or your release pipeline would be tightly coupled to the cloud provider. The programming languages, as, as we saw, are limited, right? Depending on your cloud vendor. The programming models are opinionated, so you get the benefits of being as abstracted from the complexities of connecting to the to the, the the inputs and outputs. But at the same time, then you have an opinionated programming model, right? So you are stuck to that programming model. There are timeouts, so because these functions are very cheap, so what they do is they allocate your functions to whenever there is an idle compute somewhere, right? And they expect you to finish your function within a time limit. So they expect you to finish within 10 or 15 minutes, depending on your cloud, cloud <coughs> provider. So your function cannot run for longer than that. There are options. So on Azure, you can create uh, stateful functions, and then you can split the work in, into individual tasks, and then you can coordinate the individual tasks. Individual tasks, but each individual task has to last less than 10 or 15 minutes, depending on your cloud provider. The technology is still maturing. Um, so it's changing very, very fast. Right? And what's ugly about serverless? Cold starts. Um, how many of you have heard of the term cold start? Yeah, some people. So that what's a cold start? So imagine you so you deploy a, a, a function, right? And this function will be triggered, let's say, by a HTTP request. You deploy that to, let's say, AWS Lambda then you don't pay when that function is not being executed. However, your, your endpoint is still active, right? So you, you get an endpoint and then every webhook or any client can call that endpoint, right? So the, the listener is always active, but you don't pay for anything for that listener. Uh, so what they do is they, they, they store your code somewhere, right? So when, when you invoke that endpoint, well, the cloud provider has to get the code from, from that storage and then first they need to allocate a server. They need to find a server that has some computing power available. They allocate that, that, that server for you, and then they need to deploy your code into that server. And then after that, they need to load that code into memory. 
and only after that your your code will be ready to execute right so this is this is a very expensive process uh, and all the providers are working to to reduce the time for this but it is a very exp expensive process and that's the cost of you not being you, you not needing to pay for the idle time right if you were paying paying for a dedicated instance you would you wouldn't suffer for uh, from a call start you might suffer the very short call start meaning the code is not in memory you don't need to load it in memory but you already have a vm you already have the code deployed there and the larger your package is so if you had a lot of dependencies then the, the, the longer your your call start might be there are some mitigations here as, as the mitigation strategies but this is also it's very important to say that call starts only impact you if you have an interactive or synchronous uh, scenario so if you have a user that is waiting for a response then a call start might be very painful but if you have two systems talking to each other in the background it's okay if, if system a has to wait for five seconds right or three seconds it's not too bad or if you put a message into a queue and then another system has to read a message from that queue if that has to wait three seconds or five seconds then it might be okay so call starts are only uh, a bad thing if there is a user waiting for that and that user is not um, very keen on waiting for those three or five seconds and there are some mitigation strategies so you can keep pinging your function every three minutes every five minutes to keep it warm and then you would only pay for that, those ping executions but that's not a guarantee right because uh, there is no sla saying if you keep pinging there, there won't be any call starts there is no such a thing so you could mitigate somehow but it won't be 100 percent guarantee and even let's say you you are scaling out to two instances whenever you have a new request in the second instance that pinging function won't work because there is a new a new instance that is, is so you're pinging one instance and then there is a second instance so that second instance will suffer from a call start but call starts if you see the stats usually call starts are less than five percent of all the calls so it's not a major problem but in some cases might be a a, a blocker for your solution so based on that when we shouldn't be using serverless so if you have a workload where you really need low latency you cannot wait for three seconds then yeah serverless is not for you um if you have a constant load so let's say you have you're receiving 100 requests per minute uh 24 7 then serverless will be more expensive so serverless is only cost effective if you have uh, sporadic loads but if you have constant load then serverless might be even more expensive than having your dedicated instance if you need portability so if you want to run your code in different cloud providers or on-prem um, you could you could argue that you could uh, run the the for example the azure functions uh, runtime on aws yeah you can do it but then it's not serverless anymore um, so if you want serverless the full the, all the features of serverless and portability then yeah you wouldn't get that uh, if you need full control of infrastructure you wouldn't get that because all the infrastructure is, is subtracted from you if your language is not supported then you couldn't use it and uh, sometimes the programming models might have some limitations um, so for example if you are a dotnet developer and you want to use middleware of asp.net core then you, you cannot use it on, on serverless functions <coughs> any questions before we go into the demo all good the cases when you would want full control of your infrastructure uh well it's less common every time but sometimes let's say you need to have access to file system or you if you're in a windows server you need to have access to the registry or you need to have access to the windows certificate store right so you wouldn't get that in, in serverless yeah. it's less common every time but sometimes you let's say you have some code legacy code that you want to start uh, promoting to the cloud. Sometimes that legacy code has some dependencies on accessing the, the infrastructure. Is there an aspect of security in that? Or? Um, well, the security, so you can you can implement different levels of security on functions. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm an expert on, on the Microsoft one, so I, I don't have experience on, on the other ones, but so you can implement or you can implement from the most basic, um, which is just an API key or an API code, all the way to all those <laughs> client certificates and all that. Mm -hmm. Cool. Any other questions? Regarding the 
Say that again. So, like, does the repeated the repetition to be getting so every time the server calls out, or if you update somewhere, <coughs> there's a new instance that calls out? So they they keep your instance in kind of in certain kind of a cache, uh, and then like for example in in on on Azure, if 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 your fun if you keep you ping your or using your function, let's say within five or ten minutes, depending on your timeout. Uh, then your instance will always keep in memory. Well, not always, but most of the cases will keep in memory. So, so as I mentioned, only 5% or less of your, I mean, on average, of all the requests would hit a whole call start. The other 90 plus percent would have a warm start. Yeah, but uh, say my function depends on like 10 other dependencies in the node.js ecosystem. Yeah, yeah, they, 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 they keep that into your instance. As long as they keep the instance, they would keep those those dependencies. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So the call start meaning, or means that they need to put all the code and the dependencies in your VM. But if they have that instance already in memory, then there is no no, no call start, and then the dependencies are kept there. But let's say after ten minutes you didn't use that instance, it will go back to storage, or will it will remain only in storage? And the next time they need to code, uh, load all your code plus the dependencies. Mm -hmm. Another question here. Uh, this uh, would have an unpredictable cost in terms of uh, HTTP request. We don't know that how many number of uh, so we cannot plan up front that how yeah. much we want to expand on this thing. Yeah, yeah. So if you expect millions of requests, more than more than like hundreds of millions of requests per per month, then probably this is not for you. But if you know that you will receive less than a million, then it should be very efficient, or cost efficient for you. Also, cost effective, <coughs> sorry. Just addition to that, um, with my focus on the functions and service, it's not the actual function and service that cost too much, it's all the infrastructure around it. So the bill often for the API gateway to trigger the function and service is much more expensive yeah. than the function and service. Yeah, yeah. So make sure you look at the whole picture. The whole picture, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so, on, on, so on AWS and Azure you get free executions, so I think you get like a million executions for free per month. But that doesn't include storage. So I mean, storage is very cheap, but you need to consider storage, right? So if you have, if you're paying with your credit card, right, and then you're expecting zero because you're saying oh, I'm just getting hundred hundred requests per per month, well, you need to consider a storage account. You need to consider your monitoring tools, and then you have an API API gateway. You need to consider that, right? So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You you can, but then it's not serverless anymore. So you need because now you need to have you need to have a faraway container, right? And then so you need to pay for the far far gate container already. Uh, so you can you can deploy your function on a contain you can dockerize your function, deploy it on a far gate, yeah. AWS far gate, but then now you're paying for far gate, right? And then it doesn't scale. So it won't scale based on, on the, so you can run your instance there, but then you won't have you won't have um, uh, scale to zero. You you won't have that. You won't have scale out, right? Because you only have one instance. Yeah. Yeah, but, uh, why do you need portability at all, right? I mean, you're, if you want to move something from Azure to AWS, you can just write something on AWS. So yeah, yeah, yeah. This is some source. Some companies like Bank that they need to be multi-cloud. They need to have, be highly available across multiple. But yeah, probably yeah. Very few customers or very few companies will have that requirement. Uh, on the specific answer, if you really want to avoid cold start, then then I use specific uh, something like that. I give you a function as a premium tier where you can pay to, to avoid the cold start as well. So what happens in that one is a function instance is always running, so you're paying for one instance regardless. So you never come to zero, but you always be one instance. <coughs> so then you avoid the cold start. It's just very really simple. But you are really not using it. Yeah, no, yeah, so that's a trade off. So if you really have a use case where you cannot avoid cold start, you can, but paying a little bit more. Yeah, or you, you also get predictability. So you can say, I only want to pay one or two, one up to two instances, for example. So if, if I receive more than, let's say, a million requests per day, I, I, I only want to scale, scale out up to two instances. So then the remaining request will time out, but you know that, okay, I'm gonna get only this, this much charge. So there is this option to have a premium uh, inst uh, premium SQ and then you can have you can but then you it's not it's not fully serverless anymore because now you're paying even if your function is not running Once but it's an option yeah mm -hmm. cool so let's go
So how many instances? Yeah, instances of In the premium, you can. Even even in normal, like the host or JSON, you can. Oh yes. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. In the host, in the host of JSON file, you can say scale out up to this limit. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, so let's go to the demo. So it's gonna be a quick one. Um, so we only have five minutes or so remaining. So. So this is this is a serverless <coughs> function. So this is an, an Azure Azure function, and I'm going to show you how how easy it is to implement some some solution here. So this is uh, this is a HTTP trigger function that receives documents by a post method or operation, and then drops a message into a queue at the end. Right. So let's say you have, and this is this is this is very common in in, in e-commerce scenarios or in many scenarios where you want to have temporal decoupling. So let's say you want to receive as many documents as possible, but then the backend processing or processing those messages can take long, right? And you you only need to send to the client, okay, I received your message. I, you don't need to send an immediate acknowledge saying, I have processed hundred percent your message. You you only say I just received it, right? So you receive the message and then you drop it into a queue. So this is this is what this function does. So it receives a message via HTTP and then drops a message into service bus queue or topic. Um, so if you remove the logging lines here, <laughs> I just read the message from the request body. I add the message into my queue and return HTTP 200 OK. That's it. All the all the plumbing to receive a message from a HTTP and drop a message into a queue is subtracted from me, right? So three lines of code, I was able to receive a message, uh, well, read a message, receive it, read it, and then drop, drop it into a queue. And the second, I have a second fu function here that gets triggered with the service bus message and drops it into, a, or writes it into a Cosmos DB, which is a document-based database. So again, if I remove the logging lines is just one line of code to say put this message into cosmos db right very very simple let's say if i have i was having so many issues with my laptop so hopefully demo gods are okay finally with me so i have a rest client here so this is an extension of vs code and what it does is sends http requests this is similar to postman so if you have used postman this is very similar so I'm sending a request to this this URL here, and most probably the first time I send a request here, I'm gonna suffer from a call start. If everything goes well, more than six seconds, you saw. So I'm sending a very very sensitive document here. I don't know if you can see, but please don't don't remember this document because very very sensitive. I'm gonna send another one, and hopefully this one takes shorter. So now the second time, you see, first time, more than six seconds, second time, less than 300 milliseconds, right? So this is the difference between the call start. And if we go to Cosmos DB, we go to the documents. You should, I should be able to see the documents that I just posted. Yep, so these are the documents I just posted. Right? And the code, the code is this one. Right. So I just this code that I showed you is already deployed on, on Azure. And this is what, what they did, right? So receive that document from HTTP, drops into a queue, and then another function reads from the queue and then uh, writes this into Cosmos. Right? Very, very simple. Um, I have another demo, but we don't have time, but I, I will I will show you what I did here very quickly. 
So if you go to my GitHub, how many of you have used RequestBin or any of the HTTP request inspectors? Not many people. So, so RequestBin was a tool that allowed you to inspect your webhooks or HTTP calls. Uh, very useful, but they shut it down because some abuse. So it was free and they shut it down. So I created a re serverless request bin. So you can deploy your own serverless request bin. And the main benefit is that because you own the bin, so all your requests are safe. Before, if you were sending your request with JWT, your JWTs or tokens, security tokens, then you wouldn't know what, what they were doing with your J JWTs, right? Uh, here, you know that because you own it. So if you want to use it, uh, all the code is here. You can deploy it. So if you click this button, it will take you to this, this page. Uh, you can, as long as you have a subscription on, on Azure and, and a resource group, you can deploy it. You just give it a name, select a region for your app insights. You deploy it, and then you will have something like this. So you will get a bin, right? And then, again, I have... I'm gonna send a request here. I'm gonna do, do. I'm gonna send a request, get request, and send request. It's gonna be So I'm, I'm, I'm being able to inspect my HTTP request. I can see my query params. I can see my headers. Um, and I can see my body as well. Like my, body, my body was empty. I can see the body, right? So if I send a request here. Yeah. So I was able to, de to develop this serverless request bin, right? Uh, just using serverless. And, it's very cost effective because I only pay for when I when I use. Right? So there are some HTTP request inspectors that you can pay, and then well, you have some some kind of privacy. Well, you're still not 100% sure, but this one is is almost for free. So if you wanted to deploy it, you just go to my GitHub. Uh, I'm going to put the link again at the end, and then you can deploy it yourself. One single click, and that's it. Cool. We cover these two demos. So key takeaways. Um, first one is, well, productivity, as we mentioned. So it's very, very easy and very fast to, to deploy your solution. It's ideal for bursty load and asynchronous short-lived loads. Uh, there, there are some specific use cases, and it's much more than just HTTP. Uh, for certain scenarios, uh, we can say that uh, serverless are enterprise grade already. It's evolving very rapidly, maturing very rapidly, and uh, we need to understand the capabilities of each of the cloud providers. Do we have time for more? No, I think do we have we have time probably for one or two questions before we switch. Yeah. <coughs> Any more questions? Mm -hmm. So I was actually reading through the Jenkins data and so uh, they make the key plan the thing that you can actually deploy with just one thing like some option plan. Premium plan. Yeah. What I didn't understand was the difference between app service plan and the premium plan. Scaling. So the app service plan. So if you have, if you are the developing functions, I wouldn't recommend you to use the app service plan because the scaling is based on CPU or memory. So if you deploy your functions on the app service plan, then your scaling is based on CPU or memory, and it's very slow. So the scaling is very slow. If you if your load is not very bursty, then probably it's okay. But if you expect a lot of requests coming through like very quickly, uh, the, the response time is much lower in the app service plan. So I would recommend app service plan if you already have one, you're hosting some web apps or web jobs, and then you you want to uh, have predictable, well, you, you want to reduce your, your compute that you're already paying for, then use an app service plan. But if, if this is brand new for just functions, then use premium. Mm -hmm. Any other question? So you were saying that uh, the Azure functions you can deploy on the class. Class one can be one after uh, class two can be one after class one. Mm -hmm. How that works? Uh, th there is an extension called durable functions. Durable functions. Durable, durable functions. Yeah. Uh, 
on my slideshare or on my blog, so pacodelacruz.io, I have a link to a previous presentation. So I, I, I presented Bureau of Functions. And um, you can def define workflows in code, and you can say execute this function, and then once it finishes, execute this other function. You can implement even find out. Fi yeah, but this is in code. Similar to Logica, but this is in code. Mm -hmm. One more question from Yeah. Like to business intelligence, like any kind of business, if you want data, how can you apply it? You can implement. Uh, data processing in the background with, like, for example, you can implement your MapReduce algorithm with functions. And again, you would use uh, probably uh, an orchestrator that splits the load and then each each function would uh, process part of the data, right? You could you could do that. Uh, and then, yeah, you could use Python, Python or your, yeah, probably Python would be the best language for that. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Cool. Thank you so much. Thank you. Fantastic. <laughs>